comes a time in the life of every podcaster when he has to introduce the show that he's doing. And this is that moment for me, Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, the podcast where we talk about terrible people. Normally, this is a show where we give a detailed history of an awful person's life, but today we're doing something special. Today, due to the massive, outrageous, clamoring, popular demand, we are continuing with our investigation into True Allegiance, the fictional novel debut of one Benethan Shapiro. Here with me today to talk about this, this opus are my co-hosts, Cody Johnston and Katie Stoll. Hello, everybody. Sup, How are you doing today? Sup. Good. Hello. Great. Doing great. Hello. Thrilled to be everybody here. Everybody out there in radio I, land. I took a more serious tact with the intro because I think it's important to really set the tone of the gravity that, that this book demands Absolutely. from the reader. Oh, yeah. We're serious people delving into a very serious uh, book by a very serious person. You've covered a lot of serious... Serious yes. bad guys in your time on the show, but I don't think there's anything more serious than what we're about to embark on. No, no, and I, I think that uh, you know, I've, I've read a lot of books about uh, human conflict and and war. You know, books by people like Kurt Vonnegut, who would, 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 what experience did Kurt Vonnegut have to write about any of this stuff? He just survived a bombing or something. Ben Shapiro is is the man that I want to hear talk about the serious issues because I know when Ben talks about, for example, the war in Afghanistan uh, or the crack trade in Detroit, Michigan, that mm-hmm. he is writing from a position of deep personal understanding. And authority. What else could, and authority, exactly, exactly. And empathy. And empathy. Yeah, he uh, he's had lo- a lot of harrowing experiences getting ratioed online. So I he think has. He's had a lot of, you know. Getting ratioed online was his Afghanistan. And Afghanistan mm-hmm. was the war that he suggested people kill children in. Uh, he, he did that. When he was 18, someone let him write a, write a fucking column where he said, why do we care about civilian casualties in Afghanistan? So I'm very excited to see where this book goes. I love precocious kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they say the wildest things. We talked, I think, a tiny bit about Le- uh, Levon, who is the, the, one of the two villains. The two villains of, the, of, the, of Ben Shapiro's book are the president, uh, who wants everybody to have a job. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that makes the president a Nazi. And then, of course, there's Levon, um, who is uh, the black character and is also, uh, of course, a crack trading gang dealer. Um, oh, wait, is, um, is the president in this not black? No, no, he's not. No, that would have oh, been too on the ben, nose. Sneaky guy. See, with little, fiction, Cody, <laughs> you, you got to separate some things. Uh-huh, so you have a black yeah. president who you don't like and trust. You separate him into a white president you don't like and trust and a crack dealer in Detroit. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. The duality of man. <laughs> it's a basic storytelling rules. Classic storytelling rules. Chekhov's racism. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, now we, op- we I noted that Levon's chapter, first chapter, opens up with Detroit was a shithole, but it was his shithole. So you know that right away you're coming from the perspective of somebody who understands the place oh, he's yeah, talking he about. It. Don't like the Detroit shade? Just going to put it out there? Don't like it. Now, of course, Levon's neighborhood includes Eight Mile Road because uh, Ben <laughs> Shapiro <laughs> saw the movie Eight Mile and literally wow. the only thing he knows about Detroit is that it includes... <laughs> It's Eight Mile Road, and it is, oh. does not have as much money as other places. Oh um, man! Oh, yeah. it's a great soundtrack. Oh, I'm I'm in Do love. Do you think with that he uh, has memorized all the words to lose yourself? Yes. Like, yes. Yes. Does it, it in the mirror? Yeah, that's Ben Shapiro has like when he. Oh I, I can imagine him getting up in the morning and like drinking a bunch of raw eggs and like putting on like a, a hoodie, a sleeveless hoodie, and like going out to hit a boxing bag is like yeah. that song yeah, starts yeah, to yeah, really yeah. pump, and then he punches it once and he starts crying because he's hurt his little fist. Well, I see it punching it and it swings back and hits him, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe both things happen. Uh, one of the two. So yeah. Quote from Benny. 
The store's dotting eight mile road itself formed a steady depressing pattern. Liquor store, auto parts store, burned out Hulk, boarded up shop, hair salon, repeat ad finitum. Every once in a while, an auto lot broke up the monotony, or perhaps a music store. But that was about it. What idiot would open up in one of the least police streets in America? Levon would. And of course, the shop he's <laughs> opened up sells crack. Um, yeah. Oh, it sells crack. That's where you yeah. go and get your crack. Wait, is that a, 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 a storefront? It's, it's a barber it's a shop store? where mostly okay. filled with older black men. Uh, and a barber shop, you say? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, Inter- and then the back room is where he sells crack. I'm just Got waiting it. for like him to like. I have expected when he's saying like, I, I, "I'm from Detroit. I live in Harlem, in Compton, in Detroit." Yes, <laughs> he's just like <laughs> listing off like. Yes, oh he lives. In, he lives in the neighborhood of uh, yeah, Compton, Detroit. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh Jesus. God, Ben. Okay, so there's a little line here about since he and he, he, Levon and his crew shuttled crack cocaine. That drug had gone out of style in the mid '90s thanks to the federal crackdown on crack dealers. Black politicians had been the biggest advocates of putting crack dealers on a different footing than powder cocaine dealers at the time. Nobody wanted to deal crack anymore, uh, but Levon catered to a select population. So, number one, that's actually just just not true. The evidence suggests that a lot of white people stop doing crack so much is that crack is really, really toxic on your body, and younger people watched uh-huh. what it did to older people, to people yeah. who were older than them, to their older brothers and stuff, and were like, nah, I don't want that, because uh, that <laughs> has more of an impact than just throwing people in prison, but I, I don't expect Ben to have that take on things. So I did. Yeah. We're about a page and a half into Levon's <laughs> chapter when Ben describes how big Levon is. At oh, six foot three and 220 yeah. pounds of shredded muscle, Levon cut an imposing figure walking into other stores on the block. They immediately went quiet when he came in. When he told them he'd graduated from the U of M, they got even quieter. This kid was brutal and smart, they knew. Um, I'm just, that's excellent. That's mm-hmm. excellent, Ben. I'm I'm reminded of um weirdly the word articulate for some reason comes to mind. Yeah. Mom. Oh boy. Here's Al Sharpton. Um not Al Sharpton. He's the Reverend Jim Crawford, but he's but, Al Sharpton. You know. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh god. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's in he's in uh Levon's barber shop um to talk to him about uh a deal. Um yeah, okay. So he meets with this Al Sharpton character, and it's clear that, like, the Al Sharpton character wants to partner with him on some sort of complicated and cunning political scheme. Uh, because, of course, that's what um, all, all of the black leaders in America have secret connections to crack dealers um, and, and want to work with them on. Yeah. Uh, and then we get to a really, a real fun moment here. So Levon and this guy are talking, and Levon quotes Shakespeare. He says, There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And of course, uh, Al, the Al Sharpton stand in doesn't recognize this quote. And so Levon, the educated, brutal guy, says, It's Shakespeare. It means you'll learn to trust me. And then the Al Sharpton guy laughs and says, Quit quoting, de- or quoting dead honkies. You'll be useful yet. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So that's I good. I think it's good too. Yeah. That's fun. Um, I was just listening and nodding well, along. You know, like, that's it's- good. Ben's white, so it's okay for him to write the word honky. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm not sure if this is bad formatting or just Ben is bad at writing a book, but in the chapter that is yes. Levon's chapter. The latter. Yeah. Uh-huh. So this is Levon's chapter, right? And what you do if you're writing a book where every chapter takes the perspective of a different character, you expect that each of those chapters will be about a different character like from the perspective of that character. But midway through this chapter, actually right after the line quoting dead honkies, you might be useful yet. We switch perspective without switching chapters to a completely different character, a, a local cop named Ricky O'Sullivan. Ooh, that's um, bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's bad um, writing and bad formatting. Yeah. Yeah, so he's hanging out at an abandoned Packard plant uh, that looks like something out of Mad Max, uh, Ben Ben describes it, um, which is a, a known drug hangout. So that's why uh, uh, he's he's hanging out there as a cop. And I think he's about to shoot a black kid. That's the feeling I get. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he gets a 1031 in progress sign, uh, and he, he, he rolls over. Grass had pushed its way through the cement of the lot. Graffiti marked the station. Illiterate bubble letters. O'Sullivan had given up on trying to decode that shit long ago, and the lights on the street flickered eerily. So he gets into this scary situation. He shows up for a call, and then some kid call- says, Hey, pig. 
Uh, the voice wasn't deep. It was the voice of a child. And the kid stood outside the door of the quick mart, legs spread, arms hanging down by his sides. A cute black kid wearing a Simpsons t-shirt and somebody's old Converse sneakers and baggy jeans. On the his hip, stuck in those baggy jeans, was a pistol. It looked like a pistol anyway, but O'Sullivan couldn't see clearly. The light wasn't right. He could see the bulge, but not the object. O'Sullivan put his flashlight back on his be belt and put his hand on his pistol. The greasy handle still warm to the touch. Stop right there, pig, the kid said. His hand began to creep down towards his wa waistband. O'Sullivan pulled the gun out of his holster, leveling it at the kid. Put your hands above your head. Do it now. Fuck you, honky, the kid shot back. Get the fuck out of my again. neighborhood. <laughs> <You're all saying laughs> <honky. Yeah. laughs> oh, boy, you yeah. Know, I feel like Ben really has his finger on the pulse of, yeah. <laughs> on, uh, you know, how black people speak. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. That's yeah, amazing. so this goes on, and the kid says, you ain't gonna shoot me, pig, and the cop, uh, who's clearly a nice guy, does everything he possibly can to try to avoid, oh, Jesus. Um, Just like how it works in real life. This is a depiction of how, how it yeah. happens. Yeah, in the retraining se sessions at the station, they told officers to remember the nas nasty racial history legacy of the department. Be aware of the community's justified suspicion of police. Right now, all O'Sullivan was thinking about was getting this kid with the empty eyes to back the fuck off. The empty eyes. Empty eyes, man. Uh -huh. oh, wow. oh, my God. Nothing yeah. scarier than an empty-eyed kid. Yeah, and this is like, this is an eight-year-old. Oh, my God. Ben, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. I turned the page. Okay. Share it. Share I, it. I, share I, what I, you I, see. I'm going to read for a spell here, y'all. Suddenly, O'Sullivan's head filled with sudden clarity, his brain with a preternatural energy. He recognized the feel of the adrenaline hitting. He, was going to get sh he, was he wasn't going to get shot on the corner of Iowa and Van Dyke outside a shitty convenience store in a shitty town by some eight-year-old, bleed out in the gutter of some city the world left behind. He had a life, too. The gun felt alive in his hands. In his hand, the gun was life. The muzzle was aimed dead at the kid's chest. Mm -mm. No way to miss with the kid this close. Just ten feet away, maybe. Still cloaked in the shadow of the gas station overhang. And then, yeah, they have another interaction where he says, get on your knees. And the kid says, fuck you. And this is like the third time that's happened. And then the kid says, I'll cap your ass. And then he shoots the kid. Well, yeah. um, yeah. there it is. That's what we're getting at. A couple things. The first sentence, suddenly mm -hmm. his head was filled with a sudden energy or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. That's writing 101. You don't use the same word twice in no. the same sentence. <laughs> oh, no. Ben is That's a bad right. writer. Jesus He's really bad. Christ, man. <laughs> uh, also, I love going from, you know, the idea, this is a nice guy, to, <laughs> you know, uh, clearly this character just wants to kill the kid. Yeah, the character wants to kill the kid. Ben doesn't understand what it's like to have adrenaline hit you in a situation like this. I can tell you it this yeah, it it, it it's not it's not like that. Um <laughs> it's it's not a sudden clarity for sure. That's also right, like a less right. charitable picture of cops than <laughs> That yeah, I think he would want to have no, like, no. <laughs> like de describing it as a moment of confusion and panic would be uh, oh, God. better and more relatable than the gun right. is life. Yeah, like, I, like life. I'm making a very deliberate choice with my very alert brain right now. Yeah. Uh, also, I love just the whole the weird passage about like I'm not gonna die here in this place that I've chosen to live and this job that I've chosen to have and yeah. like what? <laughs> like he had no option but to be a Detroit cop. <laughs> like, excuse me. <laughs> oh God. I, I also like just the idea that like the kids like a eight years old apparently. Yes. And saying I'm gonna cap you and that's what makes him pull the trigger. Yes. And it's it's. There's a lot that's wrong with this, uh, but there is one way, one one thing I think actually Ben does get right, and I think he gets it right by accident. Um, but yes, one of the one of the say. <laughs> yeah. honestly anything he gets right is always an accident. One of the big problems <laughs> that we have with um, policing in the United States right now is that increasingly often the police in large cities do not live in those cities, like in the city of Portland, Oregon, um, where the police regularly use excessive force on protesters. Something like th two thirds to three quarters of the police in Portland don't live in the Portland right. city limits. Like they live in a suburb or, or, or a town outside of Portland or something like that, um, which is increasingly common all around the country and leads it, it reinforces the attitude that like the police are separate from the community um, and that is a problem and I think accidentally you do see the result of that is this guy instead of saying like oh this kid is a member of my community and I need to like to like talk with him and work it out he's like I'm not gonna die in this shithole town <laughs> I fucking hate this place yeah 
So O'Sullivan murders an eight-year-old, um, and then realizes uh, that the 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 gun in his waistband was a toy gun with an orange plastic tip. For a brief moment, oh, O'Sullivan wow-y. couldn't breathe. When he looked up, he saw them coming, dozens of them, the citizens of Detroit, coming out of the darkness, congregating. He could feel their eyes. <laughs> oh no, their dead <sighs> eyes. Mm-hmm. All their the everyone everyone in the neighborhoods dead eyes staring at me articulately. God. Yeah. Uh, sorry to the cop. Yep. Sorry to the cop. Uh, sorry and I, I, cop. I think it, from what other things I've read about this book, that the the kid was sent out there as part of a plot uh, by Al Sharpton and uh, uh, yes. the crack dealer in order to. This was to, all a setup. Yeah, it's a BLM type thing, right? BLM mm-hmm. like sets these things up whereby members of their community get murdered so that they can justify protest against the police. Mm-hmm. Ben watched 14 seconds of the Ferguson protests and decided he knew what was going down. That, well, that's that's is... where that chapter came from. Uh, so, yeah, next chapter is a character named Ellen, and it starts with a dead kid who was uh, murdered in the U.S.-Mexican border by coyotes. Um, so that's cool. Uh, just another fact-fighting mission along the Rio Grande. Oh, God. I, lo- I just love that, like, knowing everything we know about Ben yeah. and um, knowing, like, his opinions, uh, his demeanor. Um, I love that every single sentence of this needs to be read like this. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it okay, so yeah, uh, over the last year had seen an up, sudden upsurge in the number of children attempting to cross the border without papers. Not all were children. A surprising number of the unaccompanied minors were of gang age. Somewhere between gang 14... Age? Gang what? age? <laughs> What's gang age? What? Well, no, actually, Cody, Ben, Ben being a great writer, immediately tells us that it's between 14 and 17. Oh, <laughs> what? that's what? it. What? Ben! <laughs> that's so... I'm so, so but is that exclusive? So I'm I'm too old to join a gang then? Yeah, yeah. Gangs kick you out at age 18. Shit. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> then you got to go work with Al Sharpton. Yep. Well, I, uh, okay, ben, okay, okay, okay. Ben, what yep. are you going to do when your kids reach gang age? Yeah, yeah. You got to really watch out for those kids when they hit gang age. Those gangs oh, are going to come for them. Oh, no, that's so good. And it gets more ridiculous. So uh, after he says that gang age is somewhere between 14 and 17, some had tattoos. Many were missing fingers, eyes, ears. Law enforcement thought the smugglers had muta- mutilated the kids and sent their body parts back to their parents for ransom. <laughs> what? Uh, what? What's this book about again? Uh, I- I- everything that Ben True hates. Allegiance. Which oh, uh, some- so far is... Th- not white people on borders in the inner cities. <laughs> wow. Uh, do we have any liberals on Twitter yet? <laughs> uh, good Lord, I bet we'll get there. I bet there will be comments about social media. See, Ben understands, yeah. as a great author, that you want your book to be timeless. So you keep it yeah. vague by just saying social media or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's the way you make a work timeless. Everyone logging into the website.com. The website.com, yeah. that's it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you know what won't, kill children on the U.S. Mexican border to we ransom hope. them back. You're to not going to say Raytheon, right? Uh, you, well, Raytheon, exactly. <laughs> Raytheon right. guarantees that when they kill children on borders, there aren't enough left of those kids to ransom. That's the Raytheon guarantee. Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm on board again. Thank you, Cody. I knew I could trust on you to be ethical. Mm, thank you, Raytheon. Thank you, Raytheon. We're back. We're back. We still haven't figured out uh, who Ellen is. I don't think she's been introduced yet. She's just doing some sort of fact-finding mission on the border, but I don't yet really know. Ellen is a, a daytime talk show host that everyone loves but turns out is maybe unlikable. Yeah, this mm-hmm. is not that Ellen, um, oh. but I don't think she will be likable. Yeah, she, she's probably like a... Um... You know, uh, an intrepid Breitbart type oh, reporter, right? Oh, that's great. Um, okay, so Ellen is uh, Ellen is the wife of a uh, 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 combat general, Brett Hawthorne. <laughs> oh yes, there the we stand go. Stand in for Ben. <laughs> yeah, the stand in for Ben. Yeah, so Ellen's his wife. Um, yeah, how tall is she? <laughs> yeah. Lucky lady. And and she's angry because the governor of Texas, Bubba Davis. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> now that part proves that Ben has some oh, understanding man. of Texas because Bubba Davis would do great in a Texas state oh, election. Oh, classic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like, is, is, this, is this actually a screenplay for Slither? Like, what yeah. Are <laughs> Bubba Davis sounds like a sausage company. Yeah, it, it, Ooh, it yeah, does. It does. Uh, and actually, a really good Start your day company. with a Bubba sausage. Start your day with a Bubba sausage. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So uh, Bubba Davis had asked the president for help, and the president would had refused to take the governor's calls, which doesn't sound like anything that's happened recently that Ben hasn't complained about. Well, did um, Bubba try being nice to the president? Well, there we go. Mm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the president didn't talk to the governor about helping him with this problem of all these kids getting murdered on the border, which is the real problem of 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 uh, uh, the U.S. Mexican border is all the kids that get murdered on it, not anything else. Mm. That's that's the issue, um, is that these kids keep being murdered by these evil people smugglers. Uh, and the president refused to talk to the governor of Texas about this. He just talked on TV about how anyone who wanted to deport these children was racist. Uh, that bullshit didn't surprise Ellen one bit. She knew what Prescott would do to push forward his agenda. Her husband was stuck in Afghanistan, and her marriage was a public joke. That was proof positive of that little proposition. Don't know why her marriage Wait, is a public joke. Yeah, what's... what? What's yeah. that alluding to? <laughs> I I couldn't tell you. Could not because um, it seems like they're like a you. power couple, mm-hmm. right? Like that's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. Again, bad writing. Mm. Very bad writing. Oh, I keep forgetting that part. Uh, so she drives away from this dead kid that they're taking notes on for some kind of pretty unclear reason, and then as a they lot drive of away, dead kids in this book already. Ben loves dead kids. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah. I have seen his tweets, so yes, yeah. I did know. Yeah, uh, so he realize, she realizes as she drives away from the Rio Grande. <laughs> <laughs> after leaving, yeah, Ellen f- not- first noticed the helicopter following her truck a few minutes after leaving the Rio Grande. Okay, man, mm-hmm. yeah, you've mm-hmm. been to the border, yeah. buddy. That's uh, how, it, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a news helicopter, Ellen knew. It was too decrepit for that. Obviously a 1980s model, cheap, black. She could see it through her window, her, the re, her rearview mirror in the distance, and it was gaining. So she's being followed by, there's another helicopter shows up, and soon it becomes clear that she's being uh, followed by the evil news. And then she gets, <coughs> oh, it looks like she gets kidnapped by men with guns. Oh, um, no. Oh, yeah. Wow. One of the men shouted something in Spanish at Ellen. <laughs> She held up her hands. Just look non-threatening, she told herself. <laughs> oh, my God. She doesn't say, hands up, don't shoot, does she? Yeah. Yeah, uh, okay. So uh, it, they, they, they so shoot expect uh, that from ben. Her, Ellen's friend um, and then kidnap them. Uh, mm-hmm. Dang it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. She's yep. going to be okay? Yeah. She's going to be okay? So it looks like she's been kidnapped by the cartel. Um, so that's cool. And this good. is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so great. So she drives off and manages to escape, and then we're back in Kabul, Afghanistan, with another chapter about Combat General Brett Hawthorne. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. It was shortly after midnight. The muddy puddle at his feet ran red with his blood. All he could think about was Ellen. Ellen, living there. This is a lot more fun if you think about it as the TV show host, Ellen. Mm-hmm. It is. I, I, I'm right. picturing her. Like, yep. Like, he's never met her either. It's not like yeah. they're even acquaintances. <laughs> like, I'm just thinking of if Ellen If it right was now. the TV show host, Ellen, she would do that bit where she, like, trips over the sidewalk and looks back like, don't, mm-hmm. don't trip over that. And that's how she, she would charm her yeah. way out of this situation is, I guess, what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. Or, like, he's, he's not even thinking of, like, modern-day Ellen, like, the famous dance. He's, like, thinking of, like, her sitcom with Jeremy he's Piven. Thinking of, yeah. He's thinking of Ellen that came out on TV, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Brett Hawthorne, wounded and trapped in Afghanistan alone, is just thinking about the Ellen DeGeneres Jeremy Piven sitcom. It's like, Piven doesn't get enough credit for being so great Wait, on that Ellen sitcom from that three was years Piven? ago. Truly did not realize that was Jeremy Piven. Mm-hmm. With Ellen oh, yeah. Sitcom. Yeah. This is a this I this episode is going in a new direction. <laughs> so we get we get a lot of interesting statements by Ben here. So so again, Combat General Brett Hawthorne is wounded and alone in Kabul, and and the nights in Kabul are cold. Uh, and the good news is that cold had helped stop the bleeding, which oh, interesting. <laughs> okay, Ben. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Just like just 
by virtue of it being cold? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting take. I I, okay. I haven't heard before about gunshot wounds and just when the night gets kind of chilly. But there we <laughs> go. Yeah, well, uh, no, I mean, you really, Robert, with all of your uh, medic street training, you didn't know that to to stop blood flow, you just you put an ice cube on it. Yeah, you just yeah, hang yeah, out. Just I mean, I, there is something to say if you were to actually like put like a packet of ice on a bleeding wound that wouldn't be the most effective way to staunch it but i think it would eventually slow like the rate of blood loss but he's just talking about being having an untreated gunshot wound out in a chilly night and i, I yeah, don't think chilly. that's the Fine. Yeah. i accept yeah. that my joke backfired continue no 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 it's it's okay katie <laughs> because everything about this book is a backfire so brett hawthorne who, as far as i can tell hasn't treated his gunshot wound as, at all is keeping himself conscious by jamming the butt of his handgun into the wound <laughs> so no. that he can feel yeah. pain yeah because he's, he he's that much of a he badass is, yeah, that's what he does that's how i that's how i fix me I'm yeah gonna fuck this jesus gun christ and i'll be better so here we learn that Ben Shapiro really understands Kabul. At night, the streets emptied completely. Even the Taliban fighters didn't want to be in the open. They'd be <laughs> in nearby apartment buildings, no doubt huddled around their primitive fires. Side oh note. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, that is, oh, my God, primitive. First Look, of all, you don't have to say they're primitive fires. Yeah. It's There's just something, a fire. Jokes aside, so revolting about a yeah. white man who has clearly yeah. never been there trying to write about something he does not understand. I mean, that's an obvious thing, but just think about it. He hasn't gone there. He hasn't spent time researching. Yeah, and it's, it's no, remarkable. He's what it's like in a Kabul. few movies that are like this, and that has colored his entire opinion about what it's like. Yeah, and he clearly like uh, has a lack of understanding about how the the Taliban works, like their monsters and everything. But like right now, we're seeing a situation that is as close as possible to an uh, uh, analogous about like what he's talking about here, where the, the the war in Afghanistan like turns completely in the Taliban's favor. It's happening now; they're killing dozens of um, Afghan security forces a day. Um, but Ben is talking about how they've like destroyed all power to Kabul, um, basically, uh, which hasn't happened because for one thing. Part of how do you win an insurgency the way the why? Taliban has is you don't like deliberately piss off civilians for no good reason. Yeah, um, like why would you do that? But how else could he frame them like primitive cavemen, Robert? Yeah, exactly. Well, yes. you could just use the word primitive when you're describing them. Yeah. But it's, then it would be it's, see, then it would be too obvious because it's a fire. It's necessary. It's like okay, well, it's primitive fire point as opposed yeah. to like these are primitive people, and I think they're oh my god. Yeah. All right then. Yeah, these are yeah. He he had to really emphasize how primitive and pitiful the Afghan people are. Um, so Brett's headed towards the airport because the airport he knew would still be in American hands. Um, yeah, he knew he'd but he knew he'd have to stay quiet with the Taliban presumably running the place. There would be a bounty out for U.S. soldiers every time he brushed his shattered arm against a wall, swollen to twice its normal size. He gasped in pain. Then reluctantly, he took the magazine out of the gun and bit down on it hard. Better to crack a few teeth than to be featured on CNN being dragged through the streets. And an empty gun wouldn't be of any use to him anyway. Why is it still in your hand then, Ben? Um, yeah, so he here he compares it to the last helicopter uh, out of Saigon, yada, yada, yada. Um, so he gets to the gate, and he realizes that the gate's uh, been blown wide open, and the U.S. air base in Afghanistan has been uh, taken over by the Taliban, and all of the U.S. soldiers are dead. Yeah, so that's cool. The advanced soldiers and their primitive enemy. Yeah, yeah, they'd somehow managed to, to blow the gate open and execute all the survivors. Um so that's awesome. Um, good, good for the Taliban, I guess. You know, you gotta, you gotta support an underdog at times like this. Um, <laughs> Do you? <laughs> Blood covered the floor, the walls. It slicked the floor at like oil at a transmission shop. <laughs> Oh, okay. Bill, I need you to say I need you to say that sentence again, please. Uh, blood covered the floor, the walls. It slicked the floor like oil at a transmission shop. <laughs> a transmission shop, another place Ben has never been. Yes, Ben clearly knows shop. a trans. Yeah, like what a mechanic shop is like. Just the floor is coated in oil all the time. Unbelievable. Also, yeah. like, just like you repeating yourself. Like it's covered. It's covered. Also, mm -hmm. it's like, like it, just do pick one. Do the second part. Do the metaphor that you're trying to do. <sighs> yeah. Whatever. Uh, it's fine. It's, it's awesome. Um, so, yeah, they, uh, uh, the, the Taliban who, uh, Ben, Brett 
tells us is, is sure to tell us our fucking animals um, have tortured all of the people that they captured horribly before killing them, um, which is interesting because one time when they captured a U.S. soldier, they kept him alive for like five years and he was eventually ransomed back to the United States. Um and they were pretty bad to him, but they didn't uh, uh, torture him to death just for fun because that's mm-hmm. not productive. But you know, Ben 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 understands the Taliban. Yeah, he, uh, he gets it. You know, uh, who doesn't torture people? The United States of America. Never, never. never. I don't think that's ever happened. Um, so now, okay, finally, eight or nine hours after getting his wound, uh, Brett Hawthorne decides to set the ar- his arm to like actually treat his his shattered and gunshot riddled arm. So that's that's when you do that. Um, that's the time. That's the time for it. That's... Yeah, yeah, that's good. So he can tell by looking at it that there's no internal bleeding. Um, that but the arm is swollen <laughs> and it's bulging. Yeah, if he left the broken bone hanging around inside, it would cut an artery sooner or later. Ben Shapiro, medical expert here. Oh my god. <laughs> well, his wife's this a doctor. doctor. Is this, I was yeah. just gonna say, is his wife a doctor? I was yeah. Just, he could, uh, he... Honey, honey, uh, does this sound realistic? Yeah. No. Oh, I'm putting it in anyway. I love it because, like, he definitely didn't ask her because why would he no. ask a woman anything about their opinion? But I also, bet she's never read uh, the book she to definitely get didn't read it. Yeah. Yeah. Because she'd be like, Ben, don't. But she couldn't. How could she get through this? Yeah. Uh, that's the great. The secret to their marriage is she does not pay attention to any of the things he does. Yeah. Never been online. So he uh, he manages to guess the amb- the dead ambassador because remember the the corrupt U.S. ambassador who uh, got his job by supporting the president's campaign and so he got the cushy position of an ambassador mm-hmm. to Afghanistan, mm-hmm. which is what every every, every rich man that's... wants. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, you remember how Trump gave all of his donors ambassadorships to Afghanistan and Iraq, the um the real plum the coveted cases. Uh, positions. Yeah, that that. That crown jewel of a position. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure he did give donors ambassadorships. Yes, but not, yeah, but to like, you know, countries where you'd but... want a vacation. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. Yeah, like Germany. Yeah, you, you get to go to Germany if you support the president. You, you tend to not put someone you like as F- ambassador to Afghanistan. Not a great gig. Um, but he, he opens the briefcase, the locked briefcase that is like handcuffed to the dead uh, 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 ambassador um, that the Taliban who had like stolen everything that wasn't nailed down apparently left this rich man's ble- briefcase just unopened didn't shoot it open or anything but Brett is able to guess the passcode for the briefcase um, and it pops open and inside is a Glock because uh, you got to have a gun um, a passport mm-hmm. a stack of Afghan money a stack of US money and a bag of opium <laughs> yes <laughs> Oh, my God. Okay, so there's a Xerox copy of a map with coordinates on it uh, in Iran and in Iraq. And, quote, Brett knew what it meant. Brett had known of the CIA's discovery of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq for years. Everyone on the inside had known. The media had reported that the government had lied, that somehow all the world's greatest intelligence agencies had been dead wrong. But that wasn't the case. Hussein had smuggled some of the weapons out of the country to Syria. Others had been buried in the desert. Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, yeah. And they'd been taken to Iran, the country that Saddam Hussein fought for 10 years in an unspeakably brutal war that killed a million people. That's where he sends his weapons. (laughs) Yeah, he does. This is wild. That's how it happened. I've read the reports. Yeah. I know the truth. He, oh, wait, no, no, no. Okay, so the, the, the weapons were buried just, so, sorry, I, I got that wrong. I need to be fair to Ben Shapiro. Hus- Saddam Hussein didn't Do smuggle you? the weapons into Iran. Um, Hussein had smuggled some of the weapons out of the country to Syria, uh, a country that he had obviously great relationships with. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Others yes. had been yes, buried. Others had been buried in the desert. Just the desert. No country given. Now, the, they were smuggled into Iran because the um, the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan and friend of the president helped the government of Iran get U.S. like helped smuggle Saddam's new like like buried weapons into Iran. The ambassador did. So that's how they got to Iran. Because the ambassador, as as Brett Hawthorne says, right before passing out, which is how the chapter ends, you son mm-hmm. of a bitch, you sold us out. So that's the story. God. That's the story. That's a good line. Uh, 
a good so good writing there's good character a lot, development a lot to analyze there number one the fact that both ben thinks it's important to know that all of the great u.s intelligence agencies were totally right about saddam's weapons of mass destruction but that saddam got them out of the country and that in the intervening decade almost those great agencies weren't able to find where any of them were buried but this random ambassador figured it out and was able to get them smuggled into iran without these perfect <laughs> and incredible intelligence agencies the best the world has ever known realizing <laughs> what was happening <laughs> right Bell. they were they were they were telling the truth the whole time they just didn't they couldn't they didn't figure out the, they didn't know the rest of it they did I the important stuff <laughs> ben would tell us that if we'd let them torture more people they would have got it right mm-hmm. Ugh. Yeah, the good kind of torture. Yep, I love what a. It, this is a beautiful. Again, it's just it's. A, it, I think I said this last time. Like I wish like a Jordan Peterson would write a novel so we can like really see like here's here's you, <laughs> here's the essence of you. But I just love what a just a perfect like fantasy this is. Yeah, this this like anti reality. Uh, wish fulfillment fantasy of his. Yeah, like the facts don't care about yeah. your feelings, guy. Just being like, what? Yeah. If, what if they were? What? If, but what? Uh, what? What if but they were right if the they whole time? Did have yeah. weapons like, of mass it's destruction? Unbelievable! It is. We what have if all seen the, all the kids that die from cops. What if they were put up to it by Al Sharpton? Yeah, it's uh, in two chapters. We've seen like Ben going out of his way to create a world where everything he believes but can't factually back up. Everything he feels, you might say. Is, yes. is yeah, <laughs> it's art. It's art in the worst way possible. It's so good. It reminds me of that one line uh, from Royal Tenenbaums. Everyone knows that Custer died at Little Big po- Big Horn, but what my book presupposes is maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't. Right? <laughs> it's like, what if everything that I can't prove was actually. Yeah. Provable. Was proven and immediately obvious. Like the this crack dealer sees Al Sharpton uh, hanging out in his crack den and is like, oh, of course Al Sharpton's here to make a deal with me. And this mm-hmm, deal is, mm-hmm. of course, to set up an eight-year-old boy to die, which none of us has issues with, so that we can protest the cops. Um, yep. Yeah. Gotta find a dead-eyed and, boy. To- yeah. God. The dead-eyed boy. Uh, and of course, all of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction uh, were smuggled with the help of a Democrat uh, into Iran, which is what all the Democrats want, is for Iran to have Saddam's weapons. Yep. I mean, I can't speak for others, but it's what I want. Yeah, That's I mean, yes, Katie, you've been you've been very outspoken about your desire to go back in time, give Saddam Hussein chemical weapons, and then send them to Iran. Um which is an interesting point to take, but uh, uh, you know, I, I respect your consistency. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that <laughs> you tolerate my 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 profound viewpoints. You know, we all this is America, and we're not going to agree on everything. I, for one, think that Saddam should have been given nuclear weapons so that he could smuggle them into the inner cities in order to execute a war on white people. But you know, and maybe honest, that's where this is going. Maybe I, don't know. <laughs> I, I kind of mm-hmm. have a oh. feeling this might be where that's going, I, Katie. <laughs> it, it is a fifty-fifty chance on that. Yeah. So our next chapter is a President Prescott chapter, and it starts with him talking to an analyst about how the the uh, a recession's coming, but it doesn't make any sense because the airlines have been doing well this year, and the dip in the stock market doesn't make sense. (laughs) Why do you write any words on pages? Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of amazing. So he's got this analyst in there talking to him about how it doesn't make sense that that things are aren't going great for the economy, and he also has General Bill Collier uh, sitting right there. Um, quote: Prescott couldn't just blow this irritating asshole off; he had to at least appear interested. Thankfully, that was his specialty. So Prescott <laughs> at, said he's talking to the general. The analyst cleared his throat. Let me start at the beginning. You remember nine eleven? Prescott nodded amiably. So in a couple of months before 9-11, there was a huge jump in currency and circulation. That probably means that somebody, somebody with an awful lot of money in domestic bank accounts, for example, cashed out in order to avoid blowback after the attack. He's been going truther here? Uh, I, I need to back up. Remember yeah. 9-11? Yeah, Prescott yeah, and the president just nods. Nods yeah. amiably? Right. I, Does he know you. what that word means? Yes, I do vaguely remember 9-11. <laughs> 
God. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Please yeah. continue. Oh, oh. Ooh, the I thing that it. happened on the watch of the president that immediately preceded me. Yes, I do remember that. With a skip in his step, he nods. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. He smiles and nods wistfully. <laughs> Those were the days. Uh-huh. So good. Yeah. Oh, uh, boy. It's it's great. Uh, so this guy explains stock shorting to the president in a really boring way. Uh, uh, so yeah, it, it's 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 frustrating. So this kid is saying that basically somebody's shorting the U.S. market, and it's proof that some dastardly foreigner knows that there's a 9/11 style attack um, that's about to hit the United States. And Prescott doesn't grasp any of this and seems to have no idea what this kid is saying. And then the uh, the grizzled general growls. What he's trying to say is that we're about to get hit hard. So that's cool. Robert, you could have been an actor. Thank you. Thank you so much. <gasps> I I love acting. Oh, I love the theater. Should we the try theater. to get mm-hmm. permission to do the audiobook of this and get a cast of people to play each character? Yes. Yes, we should, Katie. I mean, I think that would be really fun. Can I be Ellen? Yeah, you can be Ellen. We'll get I don't know. Um I'm just I'm just gonna spitball here, but Ben Shapiro to be Brett Hoff. <laughs> oh my god, please, that'd be a huge please. Guess. Yeah. If Every not, big man in this Oswald. book. Yeah. I like, oh my god, I would love that. Especially if like <laughs> if the whoever does the narrator does like this kind of voice whenever they they, they do the narration. I'm actually and then not whenever joking. Hawthorne talks, it's Ben coming out with his uh oh, so good. Please. I bet we could get an all star studded cast for this mm-hmm. project. I bet Chris Evans would do it. He hates Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So it, it turns out that it's China. Um, China's <laughs> the country that's that's shorting the U.S. stock market uh, because they know that there's an attack coming. Um, and the, the president... The primitive Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and the president... Uh, so the general is like, we have to do something about this. This is, you know, there's an attack coming. This is serious. And the president uh, speaks to him like he's a third grader, which in the president's mind, this general is because all American democratic presidents hate the military. Um, and they, they don't, for example, hire numerous generals and then fire them saying that they're all idiots. That would never happen with a Republican president. Only a Democrat. Would, Only a Democrat would, would do disrespect that. Yeah. the wonderful generals this way. So that's great. Uh, <laughs> uh. Yeah, okay. So the the general's advice sums out to being, all I'm saying is that we ought to check it out, sir, if only to cover our asses should something go wrong. And the president says, well, I disagree. This discussion is tabled. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Um, That's cool. Uh, There's also a a line in there where they talk about the 9-11 report, but it gets rejected out of hand as as compromised. Um, So that's a a thing I didn't realize Ben believed. (laughs) I just, his, his, his perspective on Obama is so funny. Because, like, I know at least we and a lot of people listening, I'm sure, like, wow, Obama compromised too much and he really bent uh, over backwards to please people he shouldn't have and so on. And Ben's just like, Obama went in there and he told everyone to shut the fuck up and he did whatever he wanted. And, and it's like, Ben, what do you... <laughs> Yeah, what's the narrative? So immediately after this meeting, the president gets on the phone with the premier of China, which is not how international relations tend to work as a general rule. Um, and the pres- the premier of China immediately agrees to a request from the president to buy a bunch of bonds. So uh, Prescott gets off and sells out America to the Chinese instantly, like right after this meeting. Uh, and, quote, Prescott thanked him profusely and promised him that the United States understood the position of the Chinese government with respect to military exercises in the South China Sea, but asked that all that the expert, uh, exercises take place sporadically rather than all at once and then hung up. And they say the Chinese are tough to deal with, Prescott thought to himself. <laughs> <laughs> Then he ignores a call from the governor of Texas because he hates Bubba Davis. Uh, 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 fuck Bubba. Yeah, 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 fuck Bubba only, Davis. Yeah, the Democratic president holding personal grudges against specific yeah. states um, because so he, of... Yeah. yeah, a thing that only a Democrat would do. So mm-hmm. he tries to ignore Bubba Davis, but Bubba says it's urgent, so he has to get on the fo- phone with him. And Bubba's just begging him to send troops to the border. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yeah. Is he gonna? Uh, yep. 
Kind of. Yeah, he wants him to send troops to the border because one of the governor's staffers was kidnapped by cartel people. Um, this book is wild. Yeah, so that's an <laughs> a, that's an act of war. So the governor says this is an act of war, and the president says rightly it's not an act of war if it's not by a foreign government, which <laughs> you I'm might s- recognize as accurate. <laughs> I think he's trying to do too much. He's shoving five different books into one yes. book. Yes, yes, because he yeah. has to get all of his political s- beliefs into this one book. Um, and, he's uh, got to jam uh, him in there. Yeah, it's neat because, like, by this logic, I don't know, we could look at the fucking kidnapping of, uh, or, like, the mafia executions of, like, local politicians in the the Northeast that happened in, like, the 60s and 70s and 80s. I was like, what, are we going to war with Italy? Is that what that is? No, it was a crime syndicate killing somebody who got in the way of what they were doing. Only dangerous right. lunatics would view that as an act of war with a foreign government. Yeah, we. I mean, we could, we could do that with just any crime. Mm-hmm. Oh, and so the governor. Like that person's crime. We're at war with that nation now. Yeah, one of their citizens committed a crime against us. So the the president's like, it's not an act of war if it's not by a government. And the governor of Texas says, "Horseshit, Mr. President. You know as well as I do that the Mexican government is run by the cartels, and they killed one of my people, one of your people." Mm. So. Bold ben statement. understands Mexico. Um, it totally understands Mexico. Uh, that's good. That's great. Um, you know what else is good and great, Robert? The products and services that support this podcast. Yes, <laughs> that part. Yeah, it's the saddest I've ever heard you. <laughs> yeah, I. This is. I'm going to be honest with you all. Less fun than the first time. Oh. Mm. Yeah, we're yeah. getting in, we're yeah, we're getting real time. deep into it. That, that's good. That's good. Okay, I want to note before we roll out to ads. I just want to get to the end of Prescott's chapter. Um, so he gets off the phone with the governor um, and says that he's going to charge them with uh, breaking federal law if uh, uh, his boys on the border shoot anybody. Um, and yeah, then he hangs up uh, uh, on the governor of Texas after threatening to put him in jail if he does anything like that. And then he gets a call from Jazz, Jasmine Jacks, the national security advisor, um, also his longtime political mentor. He could hear her sexy fingers manipulating the phone. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she's in the situation room, Mr. Passage. President, and she says you might want to get down there. Something about Brett Hawthorne. Oh, I thought you were going to say something about bread. No, no. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something about her sexy fingers again. Yeah, his, the sexy fingers of his national security advisor. Um, playing with the... He could hear her sexy fingers playing with a phone? I'm trying to figure out who that is because I was thinking at first Condoleezza Rice. Um, right. But uh, <laughs> she wouldn't work for a Democrat, would she? And also, yeah, I don't know. Um, we'll we'll see if it becomes clear where Ben's going with this. I mean, right. I like, it's clear. obviously, every single person is somebody <laughs> yes. in real life. And what I'm taking away right now is that Ben's got a thing for fingers, you know? That's what ben I got does. Too. Ben does have Instantly. a finger fetish. Got to be, gotta be real that. tall and... Uh, yeah, check out those sexy fingers. You know what I've got a thing for? Products, Products and, and services. services. <laughs> mm, here we go. We're back. Okay, so we open with another chapter from Ellen, Brett's wife, uh, uh, sh- who escaped, you know, murder, although her friend got shot by the cartel. Uh, and it starts with her noticing that that Brett had lost weight. Funny, that would be the first thought to cross Ellen's mind when she saw him on television. But it was. He, he was always so self-conscious about the four or five pounds around his middle section he couldn't shake. Oh what God. he liked to call the famed Hawthorne underbelly. That's just Ben. That's what just that Ben being just, that is just anxious ben. about his own weight problem. That is his own <laughs> personal yeah. body yeah. issues uh, manifest once again. In this book that is just a window into his soul. Yeah, yeah. A complete and utter window. So Brett Hawthorne has been captured. Um, yeah. He, yep, yep. That's what happened after he passed out, having realized that Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons had gotten smuggled into Iran by the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan. He should have bit down harder on that bullet, and now he's in a real scrape. <laughs> now he's in a real, real, real trouble, Brett Hawthorne is. Uh, so Bre- Brett's captured. Uh, he's wearing an orange jumpsuit. Um, 
Yeah, and he's he. This is like they they've gone and like d- gone I- like ISIS video or Al Qaeda in Iraq video from this, uh, even though it is the Taliban. Um, but yeah, whatever. Yeah, th- th- that's close enough. At least he's captured and being uh, ransomed, unlike you know uh, all of the other ransomable people like the Avant Ambassador who they just murdered for no reason. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Huh. Yeah. yeah. So they're they're threatening the president that if he doesn't withdraw the U.S. like U.S. bombers from Afghanistan, they're going to cut off uh, General Brett Hawthorne's head. Um, and then the president says we're not going to bow before terrorists, which you'd expect to be like the attitude that Ben Ben would support. But I'm sure we'll find out that the president is actually somehow being evil in this yeah, too. Yeah, evil man. Yeah. Um, if he cuts off uh, his head, then that's there's that four pounds doesn't have to worry about it anymore right oh there Just you go need to interject i opened twitter randomly as we're sitting here and shapiro is trending so oh Wolf dear god what did he do what did he do oh it's because he said that um it's about uh covid and uh sacrificing your grandma for the economy and if it was young people dying, it'd be fine. But if you're oh, 80 year old grandma, quote. it's If all somebody who is quote. 81 dies of COVID, that is not the same thing as somebody who is 30 dying of COVID 19. If grandma dies in a nursing home at 81, that's tragic and it's terrible. Also, life expectancy in the United States is 80. Fuck that's a you. really good Shapiro impression, Sophie. Yeah. Thank you so much. I was trying really hard, but sacrifice also, fuck the you, old ben. ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro, famed advocate of life and its preciousness. Um, oh, it looks like he was saying that to Dave Rubin. Yeah, that sounds about right. That <gasps> sounds about right. Anyway, back yeah. to the topic at hand. Yeah, I love so- also just sorry, real quick in regards to exactly this that we're talking about. Dave Rubin earlier said a similar thing to uh, Larry King, his hero, and Larry King was like, "Dave, that's stupid. Come on." Nice. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, Ellen uh, sees her husband uh, kidnapped and, you know, the, uh, uh, the president say that he's not going to rescue him, which is bad in this instance, although I think in other instances, Ben would support the president refusing to negotiate with tech- terrorists. Anyway, Ellen lives in Texas like all good Americans, except for Ben Shapiro, who lives in California. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but let's not analyze that so- too much. Oh, good Lord. Born, okay, grown, there's a lot. raised, lives yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Okay, so there's protesters out uh, in front of the, the Texas governor's office saying, close the border, enough is enough, protect your people. And she's walking through the crowd. She edged her way past one burly linebacker of a man wearing a cowboy oh hat God. and a gun, which was perfectly legal in the state. That was reason enough for Ellen to love the Lone Star State. The fact that people can wear guns there <laughs> is enough. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> there wouldn't be any random shootings in this Capitol building anytime soon, even if the media made it seem as though every civilian with a gun represented a threat to public safety. For every nut with a gun she knew, there were 10 willing to put him down. What happens if 11 people in a crowd start shooting at each other, Ben? <laughs> like, Nothing I'm as pro-gun bad. as you're going to get, but come on, man. You're, you're, that's really <laughs> fucking stupid. <laughs> yes, 11 people in a crowd having a gunfight is the situation we want to encourage. That's what we want. <laughs> Yeah. That's how we say that's how we we're safe. Yeah. She showed the guards her ID and they waved her through. Two knocks on the door and she stood across from one time Republican presidential candidate and four time governor Bubba Davis. After a stint in B- Vietnam back in the late sixties, Davis, a big bear of a man, burly and fun. <laughs> I need uh, to ask you at some point to do a word search, please. For oh, I'm gonna do word. it. I'm gonna do it right now. I'm gonna do bear of a man. Oh, I was going to say, please do a, a search for the word short. Oh, yeah. We because have to I do don't that think too. that this world has a short person in it unless no. they are a dead eyed eight year old boy. Maybe Ellen. Maybe. I don't yeah. think so. I think everyone is over six feet tall in this book. I don't think that there is a short person in it. Yeah. That is so within like three paragraphs, the two people, the two new characters that were de- oh, unbelievable. I love it. I love this. Yeah, she's described two characters in the same page as uh, big and burly. Um, yeah, so Davis and Hawthorne are the only two people described as bear of a man. But let's see, mm-hmm. short. Do we do we get a short in here? Uh, short years ago, shortly after midnight, yada, yada, yada. Uh, sexy blonde in a short skirt. Okay, here we go. <laughs> uh, sexy blonde in a short skirt. Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, so there's, there, uh, yeah, all actually, yeah. all the terrorists are short people. 
Robert, yep. are you fucking kidding me? That's no, wild. no. It, seem, it seems like the terrorists... Yeah, the, the first two people I find described as short uh, are a so short maybe... man named Muhammad who seems to be doing some sort of terroristy deal and like a short Russian. Um, Robert, the, yeah. I'm so fuck- um, you made me, you made me think... so fucking happy. Uh, that, oh my God. <laughs> this book is tragic then. It's about all of his own self-loathing. <laughs> yeah, the terrorists are short. Yeah, I think ben, all the terrorists are short. Come on, man. I, I think all the terrorists are short. Um, now <laughs> it is worth noting that the main bad guy, Levon, or at least one of the big bad guys, is tall and shredded. So, yeah, yeah, okay. As as was Yard, the man with no other name. <laughs> yeah, the, might... the nameless kid, the student with the fucking jersey. With <laughs> great he work, might be ben. a bad guy, but he's not a terrorist. Uh, yeah. So there I, we go. So I, yeah, uh, we get a little bit about Bubba Davis, how uh, he came home without a job, but then he got a job, which I don't know why you'd, of course he came home without a job. He was leaving his job. Yeah, Most what? people like who are in <laughs> Vietnam didn't like set up another gig before they left the military. <laughs> like that's not how that works. But okay, he gets a job working on an oil rig, uh, which he loved, uh, and and mm-hmm. then he uh, felt good enough to go out on his own with a bankroll from his father-in-law. He had to live frugally, um, which I don't think you can do when your rich dad gives you the money to start a business. I don't that, know. That's, I guess uh, you can by relative terms, but yeah. yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So he patented a new drilling technique that skyrocketed efficiency. We don't get any detail on that because Ben doesn't know anything about actually mining oil or how it works, and he became one of the richest men in the state. He saw Armageddon, um, though. Yeah, he did. He definitely saw Armageddon. Uh, yeah, so uh, he only got into politics because his local state assemblyman began calling for environmental reviews of all drilling. The way Bubba figured it, he had no choice. His livelihood, the livelihood of his workers was at stake. He ran, he won, and he kept on winning. So that's he didn't want environmental reviews of drilling. That's why he got in the politics, because that was clearly bad. Like, just be, being like, well, let's see what this might do to the environment is uh, fundamentally toxic in the eyes of one Benethan Shapiro. Um, so that's that's good. His campaign slogan was, don't let them hornswoggle you, which, speaking as a Texan, that's a word we use, all right. Don't yeah. let a horn swoggle you? Don't, don't mm-hmm. let them hornswoggle you. Oh, huh. Okay. Yep. Um... Yeah, that's um, it's so. Uh, oh God! Oh good what God! What year was this published? 2016. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, it's, what the fucking perfect year for that? All it right. is. It it really does show that Ben is trapped in some ways in that world of like late 1990s Rush Limbaugh radio politics, like which is kind of yeah. why he's felt increasingly sort of left behind by conservative media. This is my my feeling in the Trump era because he is sort of permanently stuck in this mm-hmm. the, like the, the like he's really obsessed with the um environmentalists are uh uh corrupt and part of some sort of scam like this this paragraph goes in later to how um the bubba uh opened his campaign by naming the top 3 environmental officers in the state and reading off how much they'd received from lobbyists for for the environmentalists and then how much those environmental groups had received from global competitors like the Saudi government so ben believes that, that Saudi Arabia is funding the environmentalist movement in the United States yeah um, those rich as fuck environmentalists yeah uh, Bubba Davis played politics the way like he played put football. He pushed the line. The press called it swagger. He just called it the Texas way. Ben really gets Texas. Yeah, he really does. Um, yeah. That's, oh God, that's it's that is interesting and true. I think what you're he like he how stuck he is um, in that era. Um, he has described himself as a rush baby in the past. Yeah. Um like he Yeah, I can see prof- that. So was I. Like I love yeah. I loved Rush Limbaugh. Um he's my hero and so on. Mm-hmm. So it fits. It's amazing. Uh yeah. So uh uh Bubba's Bubba's angry um because of the Bubba uh, the horn swoggled. B- right. Yeah, he's 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 trying to stop people from getting horn swoggled. The hell I so he 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 says that uh uh Have you seen the crime statistics in El Paso? Used to be one of the safest cities in the state. Now it looks like goddamn Phoenix. Uh, El Paso was in 2016 and is still today one of the safest cities in the United States. Thank you. 
yeah. like yeah and, like, and it has on, been for a long time like despite its proximity to the border been, yeah what do you like that's a it's a good example of why you're wrong about everything yeah like, yeah yeah like el paso like that city in the real specifically world specifically is like an exa- oh my god <laughs> after eight years of obama el paso was still one of the safest cities in the country so ben just pretends that it got dangerous under a different fake democrat not named obama uh, right. so that he can <laughs> yeah fucking christ ben uh, yeah, that's embarrassing. It is um, very embarrassing. There's embarrassing. a lot of stuff that's embarrassing about this. Yeah, he's an embarrassing that person. Them. Oh, good God. Um, okay, so that's great. So uh, the governor <laughs> talks to Ellen uh, about his conversation with the president uh, and about how even if the president says it's not a war, he knows that what's going on at the border is a war. Um, and Ellen says... Do you think Prescott is bluffing about, like, sending him to prison if he, you know, uh, uh, cracks down the border? It's just what he wants. He wants another Waco, and even better, a Waco created by one of his chief political opponents. Because Waco went really well for the Clinton administration. (laughs) What (laughs) the hell are you talking about, Ben? (laughs) Yeah, uh, so seven out of ten Texans want to militarize the border. Um, which, yeah, so this Ben is really on board with militarizing the border. And that's what, what this, this chapter is really all about. Um, and then, a, oh, this is really interesting because it involves the governor of Texas dealing with a massive problem, um, in his state that has led to loss of life and has outraged the population of his state. And the governor recognizes that the only way to deal with the problem is to take it. Like the governor goes to the, the, the federal government and asks for help dealing with this problem. And a careless, hateful president who rejects him immediately because of where he comes from refuses to help him and threatens him if he does the necessary, takes the necessary steps to to do anything. And so this chapter is all about uh, Bubba, the governor of Texas, and his assist, chief assistant deciding that they have to go out on their own, uh, independent of the federal government, because they have been abandoned by their government. And they're the uh, heroes. I wonder how Ben feels about things like this that might be happening now that are real and not hypothetical and don't involve imagining a crisis on the border. <laughs> this is fiction, Robert. It, it's amazing that a real thing you could see as a parallel to something Ben is writing about here happens, but it's the complete opposite of everything Ben suspects, and he hates it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's it's, incredible. Um, That's incredible. Again, it is it's it's beautiful art. Yeah. This book is exhausting. Yeah, I'm yeah, it is really exhausting. tired. And I am exhausted and we've been at this for more than an hour and I think we Oh, we have, haven't we? Yeah. And I think we've come to like the moment of conclusion for this episode because it's really telling to me that Ben does like the fact that there's so many parallels. You've got like a state that the the president of the United States clearly just sort of automatically hates anyone from that state and rejects them because President Prescott hates Texans. Um, our our president has a hatred of California. You've got that governor who has to take action to protect his state, and that action means doing things that like could be seen as like pre secessionist. Um, and in Ben's book, they're the hero because what he's trying to do is send soldiers to the border. Um, mm-hmm. And in I, reality, they're trying to lock down their state and and build more ventilators. Uh, and they're the bad guys in Ben's head. I do think we need to to you know earmark mm-hmm. where we are and continue to work our way through this book a few chapters at a time because honestly, I'm too invested at this point. <laughs> yeah, and I'm never going to read it, but I want to know how all of this comes together if it does yeah i'm i'm sure levon becomes a figure of national polit Let, let's end with our prediction so my prediction is okay. that levon will become a respectable national political figure while still selling crack cocaine um and that blm will cause a bunch of violent protests that necessitate uh, they be put down violently um after they faked that eight-year-old's death um, I predict that that Bubba will become the president. That's, That's kind of my, my guess, but was. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah. There might be like a civil war thing that in, happens yeah. at the end. I don't know. I don't know where I Ben's think, leading with this. I, That's what I was going to say is I think that there's going to be some sort of a civil war. Bubba will assume the presidency, lock down the borders, and America will live happily ever after. Oh, for yeah, sure. I, I also suspect we're going to hear more about this this international conspiracy against the United States that involves at least China. But I bet I bet some ridiculous countries think, will also show up. 
I think the weapons of mass destructions are going to end up with Black Lives Matters. Yeah, um, I yeah, bet Levon going gets to end Saddam's up, nukes. <laughs> there's going to be right. There's going to be a threat where Levon has the weapons of mass destruction, and they need to stop him from using them. I truly believe that's what's happening. I because that 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 is the most. Ben Shapiro kind of Republican thing that could happen is that the evil black activists who hate cops get Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction yeah. from Iran. <laughs> <sighs> it's everything he hates, it's... but is in reality connected in no way whatsoever being connected, which is what all Republicans have to believe happens. Right. That everything is a, a little piece of the puzzle and it's all coming to a head. Yeah. Um, God. It, it's it's a kind of thinking we all have to avoid. Like, there's a tendency to believe that everything bad is tied into everything else bad. And it's right. made more complicated by the fact that, like, a lot of shitty people are all friends with each other. I don't know. Right. And, like, it's, it's a, it's, but it's also oftentimes the difference between, like, well, their interests naturally align. Yeah. Um, as opposed to like they're all meeting and like they're meeting in a room and they're saying like, well, you go do this and I'll go do this. And yeah. then you d- like it's not it doesn't have to be a conspiracy for interests to align. Um, yeah. It's kind of like why uh, Kim Jong Un, there were times when he was willing to like be positive about Trump and the administration just because it helped individual things he wanted to have happen. And there was no there was no coordination because he was also happy to throw Trump under the bus at times because none of these groups actually give a shit about each other. Yeah, but in Ben's head, Black Lives Matter, I'm certain, is about to be collaborating with Iran to use Saddam's weapons of mass destruction on America. That That Absolutely. is, I think, where this has to be headed. Yeah, the domestic yeah. terrorists are working with the international yeah. terrorists. The domestic um, terrorists, which certainly are not going to be for example, white militia dudes who, as we all know, never commit terrorism. No, they're the heroes. Uh, I'll tell mm-hmm. you what, uh, if uh, some white militia dudes uh, went somewhere and did and did some crimes to people in Mexico, I bet uh, he wouldn't be like, well, this justifies Mexico starting a war with us. Yeah, there's never been a case of members of a militia killing a child on the border. That mm-hmm. never happened in the episode we did about the border militia community and its growth in history. Nothing like that occurred. I I believe you. <laughs> I'm waiting also for a... Uh, have we seen a, a right wing... Have we seen like a Rush Limbaugh, Ben Shapiro type? In we have yet? to. I, I'm, I'm going to guess we are. Although I think you know, it, it'll be interesting if we don't, if there's no like actual like Ben Shapiro media personality stand in in this book. I think that's going to be really interesting because it might suggest to me that Ben Shapiro... Um, kind of hates himself and what he does and wishes he'd join mm-hmm. the military, but he doesn't think he was big enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sh- too, short enough to be a terrorist, not tall enough to be Oh, uh, Ben, hero. yeah, we got to dig more into these terrorists next. Maybe we'll start the next one with that. But for now, I need y'all to plug your pluggables. Cool, yeah. Check out our show with Robert, Worst Year Ever, also on iHeartRadio. And we have another podcast called Even More News, uh, you can check that out. Cody, say the rest. And a YouTube show called Some More News. Uh, there's uh, websites like Patreon, Twitter, and things related to that. And I'm on Twitter, Dr. Mr. Cody. And Katie's on Twitter at... Katie Stoll. You can find me on Twitter at I write OK. Uh Also, we're doing helping with a fundraiser to provide diapers to poor families in the Portland area at the Portland Diaper Bank. You go to GoFundMe, COVID-19, response and diaper need, you can donate. Uh, fans have donated somewhere around $3,000 already, which is great. Um, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so, again, times are fucked up. People like Ben Shapiro have more influence than they should ever have had, which is none. But sometimes we can do things like make sure uh, a few hundred women without much money don't have to worry about diapers for their babies. So COVID-19 response and diaper need on GoFundMe or just find my pinned tweet on Twitter at I write OK. So you can also buy shirts. Yeah, if great you job, want. Robert. They mm-hmm. exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a podcast called The Women's War. It's upbeat. You should listen to it if you want to know how things could be better in a world where people like Ben Shapiro don't have influence. All right, that's the episode. What a world. Everyone wash your hands and have a good day.